Okay, this is a quick tutorial on the pathophysiology of cystic fibrosis, starting out with the definition, moving on to the molecular pathology, and then finally how it affects our various organs. So, cystic fibrosis can be broken down into three broad categories. Uh, first is classic cystic fibrosis, which is the most common. It includes involvement of one or more organ system, including the lungs, pancreas, and in males, the epididymis. It also includes, uh, which is the most important criterion, <clears throat> a very high uh, chloride content in sweat. So. Non-classic cystic fibrosis requires the presence of damage to the same gene that's involved in um, classic cystic fibrosis. However, there is no elevated sweat chloride. CFTR related disease, however, are a group of diseases that have patients with the same cystic fibrosis genotype but more minor complications such as sinus inflammation that is brought on by the presence of a minor C cystic fibrosis mutation. Now, onto the molecular pathophysiology of cystic fibrosis. So, here we have a diagram of the inside of a cell. Nucleus, plasma membrane, Golgi apparatus, all of that good stuff. And uh, in cystic fibrosis, the normal gene product of a gene called CFTR, uh, which is on chromosome 7, uh, gets produced in the nucleus. It's translated into a protein in the cytoplasm, processed in the Golgi as usual, and then reaches the plasma membrane. So, this cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, CFTR, <clears throat> has an R domain, and, which is a regulatory domain, and a nucleotide binding domain. When uh, ligands such as, for instance, acetylcholine uh, bind to receptors on the cell surface, they initiate a reaction that causes the production of cyclic AMP that's going to be my cyclic AMP and that in turn results in the production of or the activation of protein kinase A which binds to the regulatory domain of the CFTR when this happens a chloride channel in the uh, CFTR opens up and chloride flows from within the cell out. So that was the normal physiology of the CFTR gene, but in cystic fibrosis there is generally something that goes wrong with the CFTR gene product so that it actually doesn't work. And the most common way for that to happen is there's a mutation in the CFTR gene in, the, in chromosome 7 which leads to the production of a malformed gene product and this gene product when it's processed in the Golgi um, as usual it doesn't fold properly and instead is targeted for degradation Mamma mia! Yeah exactly that's not good news. Other cystic fibrosis forms are caused by mutations in the gene that are so bad that no actual gene product forms, so there's no CFTR to take to the cell surface. Other forms of the mutation that are present in uh, cystic fibrosis are the production of a defective gene product that when it does reach the surface can't hydrolyze ATP and so uh, because it can't hydrolyze ATP, it can't form the pore that's necessary for chloride to flow out of the cell. The final form of uh, cystic fibrosis mutation is one in which can actually hydrolyze ATP to AMP, allowing for the formation of a pore in the membrane. But for some reason, this pore isn't properly formed and Chloride floating around in the cell can't get out. 
So the mutations I just described can be classified into six groups. Um, class 1, 2, and 3 are the classes that lead to severe cystic fibrosis. 4 and 5 lead to a mild form of cystic fibrosis. And 6 leads to C CTFR-related diseases. So class 1, as I said, leads to defective protein synthesis which is where there's no protein produced at all. This is the most severe form of cystic fibrosis because there's just nothing on the cell surface to work with. Class 2 is the case that's actually present in 70% of cystic fibrosis patients and that is where we have abnormal folding of the, cystic, of the CTFR gene product which leads to its degradation. Then we get class 3, which is defective regulation. This is the one that I described in which ATP cannot be hydrolyzed by the CTFR. Then we move on to class 4. Class 4 is where we have decreased conductance of the uh, chloride ions because the ion channel isn't formed properly. Then down here, class 5. I actually didn't go into detail with, but that's where you just have reduced abundance of the protein because of damage to the introns and regulatory mechanisms for uh, translation of the CTFR gene. And finally, if I can find it, where is it? There we go. Class 6, altered regulation. This is the case where, because the CTFR is actually associated with other uh, ion channels in the plasma membrane, because of damage to the CTFR gene, it's unable to properly regulate the associated uh, ion channels, leading to uh, more mild forms of disease. So we've seen on a micro scale just how the lack of the CTFR gene can decrease the pumping of chloride out of the cell. In this section we're going to look at the macro scale implications and first we're going to look at the respiratory system. So if we zoom in on the trachea uh, then we'll see what is called the muco mucociliary escalator which is a system uh, of ciliated epithelium which it's depicted here with the, these are the epithelial cells. These little cilia here beat or move in a concerted fashion so that the fluid layer that actually is covering the cilia is shifted up and gets pushed up into the mouth before it gets swallowed back into the stomach. And uh, any viruses or dust or bacteria that were initially caught in this um, membrane get swallowed and destroyed in the, the juices of the stomach. In cystic fibrosis, however, the chloride ions aren't able to get out onto the luminal surface into the pericellular fluid and um, because it creates a hypotonic solution, there's a thickening of the pericellular fluid and the mucus in there, which prevents the cilia from beating in a way to shift all of that fluid up towards the mouth where it can be swallowed again. Therefore, all of the um, viruses and bacteria that were caught in the mucus of the pericellular fluid get to replicate and grow, and that leads to recurrent infections. And from there, you get uh, constriction of the airways as inflammation results. You get a bunch of neutrophils flowing into the area, constricting the airway, airways. When you get, have that, the air, of course, can't pass us freely, which leads to wheezing and respiratory distress, difficulty breathing. If we shift our view down into the pancreas, we see that a similar uh, a similar occurrence prevents the extrusion of 
the normal pancreatic fluids and leads to blockage of the uh, pancreatic ducts and that can lead to pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas, as well as difficulty digest digesting foods because the pancreas can't release its digestive enzymes into the gut. And there are various um, symptoms because of all of that as well. It's important to note, however, that the CFTR has the opposite effect in the skin as it does in other organs. So as we said before, the CFTR prevents or allows, sorry, the CFTR allows for chloride to flow out of the cell into the lumen or the extracellular um, area uh, because of channels it forms. But in the skin, the sweat gland specifically, the CFTR prevents or prevents the outflow of chloride. And so in its absence, there's excessive chloride buildup on the skin, which is why you have this uh, salty skin uh, that's associated with cystic fibrosis. A lesser understood aspect of CFTR um, pathogenesis in, uh, in cystic fibrosis is the lack of motile sperm because of actually the lack of vas deferens, vas deferens in um, affected males. So the CFTR is necessary for the proper organogenesis, for the proper development of the vas deferens in the testes of males. And without it, uh, there are no sperm and therefore men, are, cystic fib men affected by cystic fibrosis are also infertile. To finish up, we're gonna take a quick look at the histology of a normal pancreas. Here we see the I let the Langer hand, this is where you have the beta cells that produce insulin. Pancreatic ducts, right here. Blood vessel, um, acinus, which are the little kind of um, centers for production of pancreatic exocr exocrine fluid. So this is what a normal pancreas looks like. And this is what a cystic fibrosis pancreas looks like, where we have lots of this scarring, this um, fibroblast material, which is kind of like scar tissue, all in between all of the um, various ducts of the pancreas. And then in the actual ducts, we see buildup of mucus that actually expands and dilates the, uh, the ducts, which is uh, blocking them, preventing them from releasing their fluid into the intestines. And of course, that leads to improper digestion of fats and improper absorption, um, uh, steatorrhea, which is fatty, um, fatty stool, and uh, inability to absorb all of that, all of those nutrients that would normally be broken down by the pancreas, which leads to stunted growth. So I hope you learned a thing or two about uh, the pathophysiolo pathophysiology of cystic fibrosis. So all we can say right now is... Uh, yeah, till next time.